Hello, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, the official podcast of Catholic Studies Academy. I am Dr. Benjamin Smith, lecturer in philosophy with Catholic Studies Academy, and I am joined by Mr. Joe Grossheim, graduate student at the Center for Thomistic Studies in Houston, Texas. Welcome to the program, Joe. Hey, Dr. Smith. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So today we've got a, uh, I think, you know, what you might even consider from a, a Catholic philosophical sort of angle, a hot topic, right? So, you know, some some topics are a little more uh, spicy than others. Sometimes, you know, we deal with things that are a little uh, uh, abstract, you know, uh, you know, kind of the permanent questions and things of that nature, right? But, uh, you know, for today, we're going to deal with the question of uh, human dignity. Uh, recently, Alistair McIntyre at a conference uh, gave a talk in which he really sort of, I think, you know, pretty aggressively um, criticized the role of human dignity in 20th century ethics. Uh, and that's, you know, it was taken, um, I mean, it was, a, it was an, you know, if you've read anything by McIntyre, even when he, if, even if he doesn't get it correct, you know, he's always informative and interesting and engaging, right? Uh, and so uh, it was very engaging uh, criticism and drew quite a bit of response because, you know, if you paid any attention uh, in the 20th century, you noticed that human dignity has become one of the primary concepts used in even, you know, natural law ethics, virtue ethics, uh, just sort of broadly in moral theology, right? Uh, and so uh, there's a good bit of uh, back and forth. Ed Fazer uh, sort of had some comments that he uh, made about uh, uh, McIntyre's uh, criticism. So it, it generated a nice discussion. I think he needed discussion. And today, uh, Joe and I want to uh, contribute to that uh, by looking at what um, Thomas Aquinas has to say about uh, human dignity. Um, and, the you know, the real um, sort of, I guess classical place to begin this is to look at the 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 classical text, which is at sixty four two. This is in the Secunda Secunda, correct, Joe? That's right. Yeah, Secunda Secunda sixty four two. All right. Yeah, and so you know, in the Secunda Secunda, we get a lot of detailed ethical treatment, right? Sort of like in the first, in the you know the first part of the second part, you know, you get a lot of principles. It seems to me. Uh, laid out. And then in the second part of the second part, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. You might, I think this was the version, this was the, the, the part that was most copied in the medieval period uh, was the Secunda mm. Secunda uh, because uh, it was the most practically useful to confessors. Yeah. That's right. what I was just thinking. Yeah. If you're teaching priests, this would be really important. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you get a lot of detailed treatments here and really detailed treatments in relationship to the virtues, right? So the way the Sakuna Sakuna is organized. We have a breakdown of, and I, I really like that because, you know, it's not as if you just sort of have a haphazard collection of applied ethics, right? Rather, as it should yeah. be, right? It's, it's, it's a systematic development that does give you applied ethics, uh, but it's applied from the perspective of, uh, of the virtues. What virtue in 64-2 this is justice. Yeah, this is under this is justice. the treatise on justice. Yeah, right, right. So we're in the the section on the treatise on justice. So, and and that's I think helpful to keep in mind. So we're asking like, what is just? What is unjust? Which is relevant to how we treat other people, right? Justice is that kind of virtue that perfects and rectifies our actions with respect to others, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important. And and. And relevant, right? Because very often in our contemporary setting, it's dignity, right? That kind of comes in as the primary concept, especially again within Catholic circles or maybe conservative Christian circles. Uh, you know, you were commenting before we started, Joe, that very often, you know, like when we talk about abortion, you know, what's the the term that's brought in, right? How do how do people explain their opposition to it? Yeah, it's a simple argument. You know, uh, why are you against abortion? Oh, I'm against abortion because it's contrary to the dignity of the human person. That's right. And everybody yeah, right. just nods their heads. <laughs> how I right, understand right. What that means. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Without really sort of spelling it out. So I think it is interesting, you know, when I've thought about abortion, especially most recently, you know, I I don't even really like this. Maybe for another, I don't even really like just saying I'm pro life in a kind of unqualified way. I wanted to say like I'm against abortion because it's unjust, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the direct intention of killing the innocent is unjust. I, like we can maybe use pro life as a rhetorical concept or something that's helpful, but. Really, what's at stake there is justice, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm anti-murder more than anything else. <laughs> that's right. right. Yeah, that's right. 
exactly. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, well, let's. Uh, this is a, a classical text for thinking about human dignity from a Thomas position, because Thomas, uh, and this is kind of controversial. Thomas in this uh, text argues that the human person can lose his dignity, right? And that is, you know, something that certainly many Catholic theologians today would be uncomfortable with. Uh, I think that's a, a fair assessment, right? Um, yeah. And, and you know, you know, as I say, this, this concept come to play a, a large role. So I think probably what we should do here, Joe, is, is work through uh, the text here a little bit. This is 60, question 64, right? Which is about uh, murder. Okay, and Article Two, which asks whether it is lawful to kill sinners. So we'll work through this text here a little bit, uh, and then hit on what Thomas has to say about human dignity, and then sort of expand our our treatment here. So um, the question is, says whether it's lawful to kill sinners, right? And you know, uh, Thomas, you know, it, Thomas is ultimately going to say it's it's lawful, right? Right. Yeah. At least in in some cases, for some members of society that's right yeah yeah yeah. so this is not he's not going to try to justify vigilanteism that's right that's right yeah that's right yeah and and really it's the 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 middle term of this argument right is is the common good in the body Mm -hmm. right of the text right so in relationship to the common good right an infectious part may be removed uh because it corrupts right um the the common good right and so for the sake of the common good the political authority in some instances may kill the sinner. Now, not, not every, every sin, right? Because that would be, you know, uh, disproportionate, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, in terms of, in reference to the political community. And what might be helpful to emphasize is that Thomas isn't thinking about a political community as a haphazard association of individuals, right? Sure, but as a right. real whole over right. which somebody, some person really exercises authority on behalf of the whole such that they can make decisions like which member of the body needs to be cut off in order to preserve the good of the whole. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, it's very important. And, you know, this language uh, of part whole sometimes kind of puts people off a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, if you think about it, really, it's it's true that, you know, the whole continues, the political community continues you know, the political community of the United States of America existed before I began, you know, before I was around and God willing, it'll exist afterwards. Right. Um, in that sense, it's, it has a certain sort of durability, right. Uh, Mm -hmm. that I lack moreover and more, you know, I think in principle, what's at stake here is I'm imperfect, right. Yes. Yes, (laughs) exactly. Compared to the perfect community. Now that again, that kind of throws people off a little bit, we have uh, I have podcasts that we've done in the past on what all that terminology means, right? About the common good and the perfect community. We don't mean, of course, that the political community is pristine, right? right. Um, what we mean is uh, that it's complete for the good life, whereas I am not, right? As an individual, right? Yeah, and the other reason it might throw you off is if you think that it's somehow what well, which it is, right? But you might have a problem with it subordinating the good of the individual to the whole community, mm-hmm. right? Right. Uh, right. Certainly, talk to people that have issues with that. But you know, even JP two, who we'll be talking about at least a little bit later, recognizes that the good of the human person is found in this association with others, as mm-hmm. he's uh, so used to saying the. Mm-hmm. Um, one finds oneself precisely in the giving of oneself right to another right so right, that yes, the human yeah. good even for jp2 is connected deeply with mm-hmm. uh association at least association right even that's right that's right yeah and if you you know want to state it uh, more strongly right say with charles de Conic, right you know um yeah. which you know my dissertation was connected to all that material you know really the common good is the good of the person, right? It's just not his individual good. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, right. You're actually doing some, you're actually pursuing your own good in a sense uh, when you pursue the common good of the political community. It's just the good that you share with others rather than the good that belongs properly only to oneself. I think yeah. seeing that, that those things come together is, is, is hard and challenging, especially in the American context for a number of reasons. One, that you know we have, the, there's a background philosophy that's at work there, right? Um, 
namely liberalism. But in addition to that, you know, uh, sometimes when you say political community, you think government, right? <laughs> it, you know, and that's not exactly the same, right? It's not, they're not synonymous, right? The government's part of the political community. It leads the political community. But the political community is just us. It's all of us together, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, working for the common good of the people, if you prefer that kind of, you know, uh, statement or the community, right? Yeah, and you might even just add and I, I worry, that the individual right, actually can't find his good apart from pursuing it in common with others in the community, right? right? If you were to try to pursue just your individual good, you would fail every time. (laughs) That's right. That's Um, right. That's right. All right. Very good. Okay. So that's the, uh, that's in the body of the argument. We're just summarizing here because this isn't the main issue, right? Uh, This introduces, right, this concept about dignity. So we have an argument based on the common good that it is permissible to kill, uh, sinners to kill the wicked malefactors in some cases. Now, there's an objection that Thomas um, deals with, and I'll read this objection because it, it, it kind of sounds, I think, very uh, contemporary, right, in some ways. And then we'll look at Thomas's famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, uh, response, okay? So there was, the objection here is, uh, is, is stated this way. Further, it is not lawful for any good end whatsoever to do that which is evil in itself according to Augustine, and the philosopher, that's Aristotle. (laughs) Now to kill a man is evil in itself, since we are bound to have charity towards all men, and we wish our friends to live and to exist. Therefore, it is no wise lawful to kill a man who has sinned. So this would be a very strong uh, position, right? Uh, I think you would probably, this would certainly entail something like passivism, right? Um, you know, and, and even stronger than sort of just no war, but just no killing, period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, uh, of humans. Um, yeah. Okay. So if we had, this this bond of charity, right, sounds an awful lot like the sort of argument you might see today where we say that, oh, our, our understanding of human dignity has deepened. And now we recognize that we can no longer have capital punishment or something. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, or we have to come up with sort of fanciful characterizations of war right yeah, in yeah. which you're in which you're 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 not actually intending to kill the enemy soldier uh you just sort of accidentally kill the enemy soldier <laughs> <laughs> you know it's kind of uh praetor titiana or whatever it's called right uh, outside of your intention yeah uh, which is uh, highly <laughs> fanciful it would, yeah it would be incredible like <laughs> yeah. there's a there's a gun pointed at me i need to get that gun on the ground and so i guess i'm going to shoot the enemy soldier so that he will fall down and, and the gun, the enemy me, gun. Right? i really wish i didn't have to shoot him but i just have to <laughs> it would just be strange right that's right that's right that's right okay so now let's look then at the response so um i'm just going to read this and then i'll let you comment uh, on it joe and i'll jump in where i need to so okay this is a response of the third objection Uh, to the third objection by sinning man departs from the order of reason and consequently falls away from the dignity of his manhood insofar as he is naturally free and exists for himself and he falls into the slavish state of the beast by being disposed of according as he is useful to others this is expressed in psalm 48 21 man when he was in honor did not understand he hath been compared to a senseless beast and made like to them. And Proverbs chapter 11, the fool shall serve the wise. Hence, although it be evil in itself to kill a man, so long as he preserves his dignity, yet it may be good to kill a man who has sinned, even as to kill a beast. For a bad man is worse than a beast and is more harmful as the philosopher states. There's a lot packed yeah. in there, Joe. So uh, there's a, the striking point, right, is that dignity is not some inalienable property right. of the human person, but mm-hmm. that it's somehow connected with what Thomas calls here the order of reason, such that when one acts contrary to the order of reason, they actually, in a way, stop acting like a man and start acting much more like an undignified or at least less dignified animal. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So making that judgment about them, that there's been some sort of change changes the way in which we then act in response Mm -hmm. to this, Mm -hmm. this new 
person. We'll still call them a person, right? But yeah, yeah. they're no longer acting like a man anymore. They're acting like a, a belligerent or like a, a you know sure. a rabid wolf that's loose um, mm-hmm. in society, and they could cause real damage. Yeah. And in such cases, right? It actually, it's not, it's not some like lamentable evil that we right. might kill this sort of person, right? Where we, sure. we actually would say, or Thomas is saying here that it is then good. That's right. right. If this person mm-hmm. is harming the whole, the political whole, mm-hmm. the good of the whole is at stake here. Mm-hmm. And that includes mm-hmm. the good of every individual. Mm-hmm. And so yes. in such yeah. cases, this member mm-hmm. or would need to be excised from the whole that is killed That's in right. order to preserve the good of the whole. That's right. And again, and that, this all falls back to having departed from this order of reason, which Thomas sees is clearly bound up with his sense of the word dignitas. That's right. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, and so really to understand, right, this text, we'll need to 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 understand what is intended by dignity or dignitas. Um, but I think, you know, just important here just to add on to what you're saying, Joe, um, when the when there is this departure from reason, right, the, con- the you know, it's the same, the, the person's still there, still a human being, right, in terms of the species, the metaphysics in question, but the, the moral condition or the condition of the person has changed such that he becomes subject, right, to acts that he, otherwise we would want to refrain from, right? So, you know, because when you go from the category of dignity to the category of lacking dignity, right, you, there, that, that is a morally significant change, right, right, in the sense that we can now, um, we, have to, we have to sort of assess you and treat you differently, Right, then we would assess you uh, or treat you if you had maintained your dignity. Yeah. So, you know, we're not saying that, or Thomas isn't saying that the man ceases to be a man. Correct. Right. But that the man ceases to act like a man. He ceases right. to act in accordance with his dignity or act in a dignified way. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. what changes the uh, moral condition of the man or the way that we would morally respond to the man. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And one, uh, just one thing I want to uh, point out just by way of uh, uh, fending off a possible misunderstanding. It's important to recognize that Thomas is not saying uh, every sinner is to be killed or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, right? for right, sure. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. He's saying, look, a sinner who loses his dignity, it becomes permissible or possible in some cases to kill, right? Right. Because of the loss of dignity. But it's, as the sentence says, yet it may be good to kill a man, right? So uh, who's who's lost his dignity? So important to recognize, you know, Thomas isn't thinking that you know petty theft, you know, uh, needs yeah. to be followed up immediately by you know execution. Okay. Society would be annihilated, right? <laughs> that's right. That's every, right. That's every right. That's every right. single that's sinner. Right. So right. Right. it's important to bring this back to what was said in the corpus of the article, and that's that when we are measuring whether or not to cut a member off of the body we look to the good of the whole body to determine that right so if you've got you know if your toe hurts because you stubbed it on a rock you're not going to cut off your toe because it's causing you pain in order. <laughs> right, right you know right. so there's there's a proportionate response measured sure. by a certain end and that that would be the way we determine what sort of what sort of action is actually going to be um such that we would then remove someone from the community one way or another. Maybe right. it's also important to say that uh, this could just could be, as well yeah. apply to imprisonment, right? Because yeah, sure. in a way you're removing them from society by exiling them to a certain place, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Now uh, this is of course, you know, cuts straight across, right? The uh, tendency in contemporary um, and say conservative ethics, Christian ethics, Catholic ethics, right? Uh, you know, the idea of losing dignity, right, sounds to many people just outright villainous or just, you know, like terrible or what, like, what is Thomas talking about? You can't lose your dignity. And I think sometimes, you know, that's put this way that every human being um, has an inalienable worth or value, right? Uh, and therefore, every human being has a has a inalienable dignity, right, to use the term uh, that you did. Um uh, that every human being uh, maybe is loved by God and therefore has a worth and value that can't be lost and therefore has this dignity, right? Um, so there's uh, uh, the idea, right, that there's an idea here, I think, that 
dignity because in some versions, right, can't be lost because dignity signifies something about the value of the person, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's seen as extremely important for ethics, right? Maybe even the foundation of ethics, right? That, the, that there is a sort of inherent worth, i.e. dignity to the individual human being, and that serves really as the foundation of ethics, and therefore it can't be lost, right? Um, or maybe it's tied to a value statement about human nature as such, right? Uh, that becomes the foundation of ethics. Um, that, that I think is not exactly right. What we think about Thomas's view of dignity though. Right. Yeah. I think there's, there's at least two senses of dignity operative in modern, well, operative in modern discourse, I would say, but uh, I think most people use one sense of dignity and then people like us might use the other sense in okay. isolated <laughs> conversations like this. So uh -huh. what most people mean by dignity is drawn, I think, ultimately from Immanuel Kant, right, right, right who um, adopted in a way a sort of personalism, arguing in one of his categorical imperatives that the human person because of his dignity as a free agent mm -hmm. um, cannot be treated as a means, but only as an end in itself. Right. And mm -hmm. that, that statement precisely was picked up by uh, Pope St. John Paul II. Right? Right. And used, uh, he got a lot of mileage out of that with his own sure. uh, sort of ethics. Um, that sense would be then directly connected to the capacity that a man has to exercise mm. freedom right through mm. the use of his reason like it's connected with the very capacity and disconnected from whether or not he does that well right that 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 sort of value mm -hmm. is always there that is the fact that we always treat him as a subject and not as an object to be used precisely because of what he is in his nature mm -hmm. and not because uh, not, you know, sort of abstracting from the way he might be behaving. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah or at yeah. least that's the way I don't know that John Paul II would necessarily pull it in that direction. I don't know that Kant would necessarily pull it in that direction, but certainly it is being pulled right. in that direction. Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's the way a lot of uh, folks argue saying that Catholic Malou Right. You know, you, you sort of have this uh, interpretation that man always has this capacity for God. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, the capacity to be united to God and that this capacity is never lost. And therefore, uh, human beings, you know, have this inalienable dignity due to their capacity for some sort of union with God. Right. Mm -hmm. So <sighs> this is the important question right is mm -hmm. what is dignity then and mm -hmm. i don't know that anyone has like really clearly laid it down or at least it's not been laid down in such a satisfactory way that in normal discourse we have a clear operative definition that yeah. everyone knows that we're using and so i think it's helpful to kind of back up from the question of murder and just think yeah. about how we might use the term dignity in ordinary conversations right. um i think like I'll use some examples to illustrate this, but I think that the term dignity, at least when applied to the human person, uh, which is what's most known to us, is introduced precisely when we're talking about the way the human person departs from his generic animal nature and, and starts acting rationally. So let me, mm -hmm. some, some examples, right? Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of things that, you know, they, they certainly serve other ends as well, but I sure. think the most distinctive thing about some of the things we do is that they separate us from animals. So for example, uh, we wear clothing now that we do that first of all, because we need to survive, but think about like Dr. Smith is wearing an excellent tie, right? Okay. That tie serves no purpose at all for his survival. <laughs> right? if anything, if, if he needed to survive all of a sudden, you know, if he's in a crisis situation, ties coming off, you know, That's right. um, <laughs> similar to like how a woman might, might ditch her high heels if she was, you know, suddenly confronted with danger, right? There's sure. a lot of clothing we wear that is clearly not for the sake of survivability. So why do we do it? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then even among clothing, there's there's different degrees, kind of like the tie, but it's more clear if you look think to like medieval regalia or something sure, like that. Sure. So the, 
the king is going to wear more dignified clothes, we would say, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. than, say, uh, a peasant or a lower noble. Sure. Like the, the crown is a mark of dignity in some way. So we have That's the right. same word associated, not just with um, the way that a man acts in terms of his dress, but even there's mm-hmm. degrees among men reflecting some different measures of dignity. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think, you know, even in modern society, right, you rarely see the president not in a suit. Yeah, right. You know? Because it would so, be unbecoming, right, of his yeah, dignity right. as president. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's lots of other examples. You know, I think uh, this doesn't these don't always obtain, but there's certainly sure. a, a general direction in human history towards them. So, like, we eat at table. Mm-hmm. rather than just on the ground like a dog would. <laughs> right. Um, right right we, yeah, uh, yeah. a good example i mean if 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 you went to lunch with a friend right and your friend just put his face down on the plate and started <laughs> like eating like a yeah. dog right you would say yeah. like eating like a dog and you'd be disgusted and embarrassed right it's like it's it's not in keeping with being a human to eat that way. Right. Yeah. Even, even though it's like, it, it's perfectly functional. Like, you right, know, I, yeah. I just got to get the food in my mouth somehow. Right, right. Right. See what I, or you can think about like eating spaghetti with your hands. Right. Like, <laughs> like again, it, okay. It works. Right. But you know, we're going to say, why don't you use the utensils? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And because even if you wanted to say that all oh, utensils are cleaner, well, I, I can clean my hands before and after. You sure, know? We got, sure. Maybe yeah. that's the real dignified way, <laughs> but it's <laughs> not. It clearly isn't. And there's clearly more to it than just sanitation or something. Sure, sure. Uh, and there's other things, too, like all of the sort of acts that we have in common with animals through our body, you know, like digestive acts, like, uh, you know, using the bathroom or reproductive types of acts. These we don't do in public like the animals do, Mm -hmm. right? We designate uh, private places or more private places in order to do them. And, you know, we have laws against doing these sorts of acts in public Mm -hmm. spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Right, Um, right, yeah. Even if you were doing it in a sanitary way, uh, (laughs) we've legislated for one reason or another that this ought to be done in private. Sure, sure. Um, so th- I think there's there's many examples like that, but all of them I think we would associate with dignity. That it would be undignified to you know use the restroom in a public space. You know, mm-hmm. it would be undignified to try to reproduce in a public space or to right. eat on the ground or eat with your hands when it's unbecoming, right? Sure, sure. So we have, I think that's the first place that we can recognize dignity in a clear way is precisely as man in his rational nature uh, appropriates the common animal nature to himself, right? Mm-hmm, so the way he sort mm-hmm. of takes up what is common that he has with animals mm-hmm. and exercises those powers in a rational way. Gotcha. Yeah. All that right. Makes sense. So um, with that general sense, I think I would, th- this is where I become a little less sure, but nonetheless, this is my best reading of St. Thomas. Okay. I think that the term dignity in St. Thomas is connected with, the like we we predicate dignity of things insofar as they have a causality which can extend to many now let me explain how i make that jump because it's not clear from the animal rational discussion but animals animals only react through their senses this is the way they perceive and interact with the world that is they can only engage with particulars right whereas the human intellect actually able to abstract from particulars can exercise its causality in a more or less infinite way. There is not Mm -hmm. a real limit to the sort of art that man is capable of, right? Granted that he knows the material he's working with, he can make things out of it. Uh, Like we can, we can make any sort of house, right? It's not like when we know how to build a house, we just learn how to build one house, right? But we learn principles that, enable us to build literally a house in a potentially infinite number of configurations. Right. Yeah. So yeah. reason in that capacity to act in a more universal mode, that's precisely what dignifies it over animal. Mm-hmm. And so then to connect it back to every, all the examples I was using before, we want to live our lives in accordance with that, with a recognition of that fact. That is, we don't <coughs> want to just act as animals, but we want mm-hmm. to act as deliberately rational animals. And we want to signify that fact in all of our actions, right? right? We don't right. want to act like the animal. We want to act like the rational animal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you see this 
you know, even in St. Thomas uh, connected with other terms that he uses, um, such as the noble and the mm-hmm. higher. So he right. uses those words uh, in places to talk about reason or to talk about uh, like a political authority. Sure. So you might like take the word noble. I think that's a good a good word yes. for us to, to pick yeah. up with. So if you think about a nobleman and what that means, like what's the distinction mm-hmm. between a nobleman and a peasant? And it's precisely that the nobleman, again, has a sort of causality that extends over many. Mm-hmm. Right. And he right. acts like a nobleman when he exercises that power precisely as a rational agent that is towards the good of the whole which he has authority over. Right. And even like a low nobleman is going to have less dignity, we would say, than the king who is over all of the noblemen. And the reason, again, is because the king has yet a more universal scope right. on his causal power than the, the low uh, lord uh, of a fiefdom, right? Right. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Yeah, that's that's all very good. Uh, and I think um, a different way of thinking about dignity that actually plugs in more with the way that we normally speak, right, and normally uh, think about dignity. Uh, but it also still relates to a good, strong philosophical principle, right? That is that, um, you know, our rationality and the way and the modes of action, the way of life that's that's made capable by that rationality, right, is really what helps uh, distinguish us, right? Uh, And you can even just kind of look at it in terms of, we look at the dignity, compare our causality to the causality of even other highly developed animals, right? You know, I mean, I'm sitting in a house that's very (laughs) complex, you know, I'm not sitting in a nest, right or kind of like a hole in the ground that's kind of dug out a little bit right you know what i mean like you just look at the kind of causality we can exercise versus the other animals you know it's, it is it's gigantic i mean we can make battleships we can you know, yeah, you know, yeah. i mean like the, the kinds of things that we're capable of are, are really uh remarkable in terms of our causality right we can organize ourselves in different ways which is kind of cool to think about right um you know there are other social animals but they seem to just have one type of organization and that's it. You know? Right. Like, it, 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 you know, like um, bees make really complex structures too, but mm-hmm. their honeycomb always looks the same. That's right. You know? They don't have like all sorts of different sorts of designs. They just that's do right. the one thing, you know, yeah, it's always yeah. recognizable precisely. And just, you just a little piece, you cut it off. Mm-hmm. It's always the same thing. So that's great. Uh, yeah. Now, I, now, when we were talking about it, we've been talking about this for a little while, but I think it's important maybe for our listeners, uh, our audience to, 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 to answer a question. Okay, let's say we accept your view of dignity, Joe, right? Or your interpretation of dignity in Thomas, right? Um, is that a normative or descriptive concept, right? That is what kind of work does this concept do in terms of helping us to understand? Well, I think it's primarily descriptive, okay. which is probably a departure from, at least from Kant, I think it's a departure, and it's probably a departure from JP2 as well, and that what I'm saying is that we're, we're just assigning a predicate. We're saying man is dignified, right? right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about what he is, Mm-hmm. And that does not for us then immediately translate to a moral response. It does not immediately have in itself sort of buried there like an ought statement. Yeah. There would need to be some reasoning connected with what the human good is, which would be mm-hmm. the middle term That's in right. order to connect that to a practical conclusion about how we ought to act. That's right. With yeah. a dignified person in front of us. Right. Sure. Sure. So in general, we, we, you know, we might think this, that, possessing dignity doesn't automatically make you good Correct? yeah well it so it depends i think there's a there's yeah. a distinction here right sure. um the dignity that i think can be lost is not something that is found automatically but dignity f- with with man seems to be connected with the way that he acts out his rationality. Right. That's very right? important. So mm-hmm. um, 
there is a capacity in man for dignity, Mm -hmm. right? Precisely in his reason. But if he fails to exercise that reason, right? Or even worse, if he exercises reason in order to pursue particular goods like an animal, which Mm -hmm. you could do, right? You could bend your whole intellect to the acquisition of food or something based like an animal would do. Right. Um, so just having the capacity doesn't doesn't imply that you are dignified. You have to exercise right. that capacity precisely according to reason. Right. So that's, I think, a, a really important distinction uh, you're making there, Joe, because what we're then focusing on is dignity um, goes really with your behavior, right? Your conduct, right? Your way of life. You're not automatically dignified by just being a human being. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Even though you've got the capacity for dignity, Mm -hmm. I think the the primary sense that's at least operative here in this question on killing sinners Mm -hmm. is the way in which those capacities are exercised. That is, are they exercised in accordance with reason or not? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's why it's possible. Right. So if it's a description, right, and it's a it's a descriptive phrase uh, that points to a capacity, but primarily to right a way of life. Right that's how dignity can be lost. Right. Because it's not just, it's not like the power of sight. Right. Right. It's the, if we're going to extend the analogy, it's like the activity, the operation of seeing, right. Not just the mere capacity. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I think that's right. Um, This this, I think, departs from the sense in which somebody might use the term dignity in that argument about abortion that we were mm-hmm. considering mm-hmm. before, right? If someone was to say, the reason I'm against abortion is because it's contrary to the dignity of the human person, what they mean, in my estimation, is that the human person has such a nature, which means that they cannot be aborted, right? They cannot That's be right. murdered. That's right. And what we're saying is that the human person does have such a nature that they have the capacity right. for dignity, right? Or that right. they have the capacity for at least innocence. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, well, that can be lost, right? If that's mm-hmm. exercised poorly. Um, right. This doesn't mean like like a baby, obviously, is not able to exercise reason. Sure, sure. It's, um, it's so we're not, we're yeah, not yeah. saying that there's um, that the only people that are dignified are necessarily the ones that are like living their best virtuous mm-hmm. life right because mm-hmm. the child's not capable of that um rather i think maybe maybe it'd be more helpful to focus in on what it means to be undignified right which would right. be precisely to bend that capacity for a, a more universal causality toward something particular and base mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um so like, looks- like when the the sinner mm-hmm pursues his individual good over and against the common good sure sure yeah so let's take that let's let's, uh, maybe uh, spell this out a little bit in concrete terms let's take a habitual adulterer right Mm -hmm. so we have a man right who um has pledged you know uh sexual fidelity to one woman right uh perpetually and but habitually has you know sexual relations with people other than the woman to whom, right, (laughs) he had pledged uh, fidelity, right? Now, there's an injustice there, right? But what we would say about the man is certainly that he's a a bad man. We can say that, right, Joe, that he's a bad man? Yeah, we can say it. That's right, because he's he's habitually doing bad things and has a bad character, right? Um, If he's habitually doing things badly, correct? Yeah, I mean, we can make distinctions. Like we can ask that why is he a habitual adulterer? Like sure. it would be it'd be worse if he if he was using the full bend of his mind, right? His right. full capacity of his intellect to, to be an scheme adult. out. <laughs> you know, uh, let's take let's take that. Let's take a, that guy, right? Yeah. So this guy uh, who, who just really is committed to adultery, right? <laughs> okay. Uh an adulterous person. That person, that man, lacks dignity, right? That's right. He's acting like a, like an animal who's just trying to, you know, spread his seed as far as he can. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Which is not the human way of procreating, because mm-hmm. as Thomas argues elsewhere, in order to procreate rationally, the human person has to recognize that children don't just need to be conceived, <laughs> but they need to be raised and educated. And that that commitment is a lifelong mm-hmm. commitment requiring right. the team of the parents for a lifelong union. 
Sure. Right. So if you're actually pursuing the universal good here, which would be either the good of the species or the good of procreating for the sake of society, right. you're committed also to the necessary means of that end, which would be lifelong marital union. Sure. And so to pursue anything other than that, especially to bend your whole reason to right. subvert that good, right, right, would be to act much more like an animal and mm -hmm. to not procreate mm -hmm. in a rational way, right? which so is precisely a departure back from the rational towards the generic animal, right, mm -hmm. which is to be undignified rather than dignified. Right, right. Now, uh, um, so in that case, right, we're going to have a different assessment of the man than we would otherwise. We wouldn't necessarily, I guess, in our contemporary legal structure, think of that as a capital crime. Uh, but certainly maybe things could be done to him that otherwise couldn't be done to him, right? Right. Um, we might censor him in various ways. Um, but if it was more serious, right, instead of, say, uh, not that adultery is not serious, but if, you know, if it was something like uh, um, murder or treason, right, or um, defrauding widows and orphans, you know, yeah. things that, you know, like the greedy, the, the rapacious man. Um, I think, you know, there you could start thinking about more real punishments, right, uh, coming in. And not that that's where our focus is, but that sort of helps us to see, right, right, like, the consequences right here that we recognize that the human person does have dignity, has a capacity for digni dignified action, a dignified way of life, a dignified character, but through uh, habitual sin can fall from, right? Uh, that, uh, that dignity and therefore be susceptible to different, uh, a different assessment than we would otherwise. Yeah. Let's, let's add like one more middle term here. And it's that, Precisely in acting in this irrational way, that is, let's right. say he's committing treason or he's just a serial killer, mm -hmm. right? He's harming the good of the whole in That's such right. a critical way right, that right, right. a proportionate response might very well be to cut him off completely from the community one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. Life mm -hmm. imprisonment or capital punishment, if that can't be managed, um, and perhaps even the proportionate response could only be to take his own life sure. in reaction to what he's been doing to the community. Right. Right. So um, yeah, I would connect it to back to the common good. Like the reason, the reason this is so harmful and the reason this changes our moral response to such a person mm -hmm. is precisely that he's harming the common good, which my good mm -hmm. is found in. Mm -hmm. Right. And if he's right. destroying the community on which my good depends Right. Mm -hmm. Not only my good, but your good and the good of all of us right, depends right. upon getting a handle on the damage. Right. right. Putting a yeah. stop to yeah. it. Sure. And, and, re and really making amends for the damage that's been done. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so just to, 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 to press the point here. Uh, so let's say I'm going to object to you, Joe. Right. And I'm going to say, Joe, OK, you're wrong. Right. And the reason you're wrong is because man always has the capacity uh, for knowing and loving God is ultimate end, or you're wrong because man always has the capacity for um, conducting himself in a rational and virtuous way and therefore never loses his dignity. How are you so, going to respond to that? So be, it's precisely because man has the capacity to know and love God that we have to remove some people from the political community. <laughs> okay. That's what I would say. So um, if, if we're really concerned about everybody coming to know and love God, right? We can't do that if our whole society falls apart. At least we can't do that as easily if our whole society falls sure. apart. And all of a sudden we're back to the hunter gatherer state right, right, with right. no time to concern ourselves with, you know, contemplating God or mm -hmm. anything like that. Mm -hmm. If someone is causing damage to society, right, yeah. which which we really need to help secure our material welfare so that we can, I think, live out our good and religious life in the best way. Um, we need we might need to cut this guy off from the hole in order to preserve everyone else who actually desires to love and know God. Right. So mm -hmm. a similar, you know, cases made for excommunication. Right. right? When sure. we excommunicate sure. a member sure. from the church, we're doing it for the sake of the church. Right. Mm -hmm. This person who is, say, spouting heresy, mm -hmm. right, is causing damage to the to the salvation of other well-intentioned people. Mm -hmm. right? Right. So somebody, right. some obstinate heretic who's been corrected and is just not responding to correction, that person might need to be publicly dealt with 
in True. order to help those people, the other people, the well-intentioned people in their capacity to, to know and love God. So right. I would say it's precisely because <laughs> a man's right. capacity to know and love God that sometimes right. uh, capital punishment might be necessary. Right. Let me uh, so add just an a, a additional angle here uh, and see what you have to say. So I think we, I would want to respond back to the objection I just framed by saying another way of responding would be to say um, that that objection is mistaken because it has a mistaken view of what human dignity is, right? Human dignity is, I think we want to say, more of a habit, right? Uh, it's a way of life. It's a way of action, right? Or it describes a way of, ha- uh, 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 a, you know, a way of action, not just a capacity, not just a power, right? And so, yeah, the power isn't lost, but that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about dignity, right? We're talking about uh, the the actual moral habits, right? The actual psychological habits of um, the person, right? And clearly yeah. that is something that is contingent and can be lost. And we know that from experience. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, yeah, there's, there's two ways you can approach this. The one is to attack the term dignity, if that's mm-hmm. used as, a, as part of the premise. Um, I, I do think it's worthwhile to also just consider what's behind it. Like, sure. I think when, you know, it, somebody after Kant uses the term dignity to talk about the human person in terms of their capacities, I mean, they're not talking about nothing. Of course. Right? There, there's, of course, a capacity that every man has for God, mm-hmm. uh, which is ought to be taken into account in any sort of moral sure. consideration. We don't we don't we're not just saying like to totally forget about that because that's not what dignity means. Mm-hmm. Rather, we're saying that when you use the word dignity, uh, that's not what dignity means, even though you could still talk about man's capacity for God and your moral reasoning, um, that that's not the first thing that we need to consider right or at least it's not the only thing that we need to consider right right yeah yeah and and it does help us to understand right what thomas means by losing your dignity right you haven't lost the power you've lost the mode right right you know yeah so i would i would place it in habit that's my my best sense of this um Mm -hmm. if you it's it's got to belong to uh power habit or act Mm -hmm. um it's clear that we're not talking about power because that can't uh that can't be lost right and thomas is clearly talking about something here that can be lost but i don't think we're talking about act either right there are acts of dignity but those acts proceed from a power in a certain way and that's Mm -hmm. why we call them dignified acts rather than undignified acts right right? so the power itself would be disposed to either act in a dignified way or it's contrary Mm -hmm. the undignified way and then when we say that a man is dignified or that a man um has dignity i think we're talking about the habitual way that he acts right whether he exercises reason uh pursuing the real rational goods of human nature habitually Mm -hmm. Right, right, which right, we would right. say, well, that's a that's a noble man, right? That's Not right. in the sense like a legally noble man, but what a yeah. what a noble guy, right? Or a good sure, man. Sure. Whereas the contrary, somebody who habitually acts contrary to reason, uh, contrary to the good of human nature, that man we would call undignified, right? right? Base something, yeah, base con- the contrary of the noble, mm-hmm. right? right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Something more like an animal. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So. Uh, um, I've got a couple of takeaways here. Uh, uh, it's sort of like a large, like big picture thinking about ethics um, that I want to talk about. Um, we can go back to something more particular if you want to after that. But there's at least two things I think are really, if we're if this analysis is correct, right? Then there are two kinds of uh, things that I think follow with respect to uh, ethics in general, right? And probably the the first and most important, right? is that if this analysis is correct, human dignity cannot be the foundation of ethical analysis, right? Um, Rather, it's a secondary sort of concept, right? It's not a first concept or a first principle, right, of the study of ethics. Uh, And the reason that's the case is because it can be lost, right? And it's lost in relationship to the pursuit or the failure to pursue the good, 
right? That which is really desirable, right? right? So you have dignity as you're pursuing that, which is really desirable for a human being. That is the rational good, the bonum and estum, right? You lose your dignity, right? By falling away from the pursuit of the rational good, right? So that really dignity is relative to the good. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and that, that changes or it, it could change a lot, right? So if you were to mm -hmm. make an argument against capital punishment that human dignity in itself just prohibits the act of capital punishment, well, if what you mean is the kind of dignity that we're talking about, the sort of mm -hmm. dignity that a man has when he's acting rationally towards the good, it of course prohibits <laughs> killing him, right? He would right. be innocent and good and a boon to everybody in his community to have right. him around. You'd be acting against your own good if you were to, mm. to kill him. Um, so if that's what we mean, then absolutely. We don't kill anybody with dignity. But <laughs> if we're being careful here, right, or if we're not being careful, and what we're talking about is just human nature, um, then we end up saying something that at least sounds ridiculous. And that would be that uh, the human person cannot ever be treated as if he is like harmful or bad. Yeah, or bad, right? right? Yeah, if, right, yeah, you're, you're, yeah, yeah. If if the good belonged to the human person by nature, if he was a good to all of us, yeah. mm -hmm. just by being human, mm -hmm. without without any further prescinding from any further consideration yeah. of him, right. um, that I think the ethical implications of that are huge, right? They're huge, and 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 I, and I think to be perfectly honest, prima facie absurd, absurd, right? yeah. You know, to say that oh well, this person is a villainous man, right? Uh, in all of his activities, but he still has this intrinsic goodness to him. Like, like, what are you talking about, right? If you're talking about a real agent, right? That real agent is either employing his powers, his abilities towards a good life, right? Or away from that, right? And the, and the concrete reality, the concrete reality of that person, you can't just abstract out and say, oh, well, his nature's good. You know? Like, you know, like in a sort of a abstract universal way. Now, actually, he's using his nature towards evil, right? He's directing yeah. his powers towards evil there. And that uh, needs to be, I think, uh, frankly, um, accepted, right? And so the, we should be able to say, right, if the good is prior to dignity, right? That's what I'm trying to focus on here, that we can talk about people being, this is a little controversial, right? But people being um, morally better and morally worse, right? You know, I ask Joe often this question when I teach ethics is, do you think anyone's morally better than anyone else? And a lot of times the student, like maybe one or two people will hold up their hands, you know, and say, yeah, but, but people are really shy of saying that, right? And then I'll ask, well, do you think anybody's morally worse than anyone else? No, like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Which I know there's just some sort of rhetorical shift there, right? Because uh, obviously they, they end up meaning the same thing. But um, it is interesting, right? Um, there, there is like there's a willingness to say, okay, that's a bad action, shouldn't behave that way or whatever, right? But somehow this this idea about dignity being tied to the nature, right, ends up saying we don't want to say somebody's a bad man. Right. Or somebody's a, a morally worse man than another or somebody's a morally better man than another. Right. Yeah. I think it might be helpful to this point to 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 mention that the good is a relative term, meaning that not that it's relative in the sense that uh, the real good cannot be determined, but relative mm -hmm. in the sense that the good is always the good for Mm -hmm. something and mm -hmm. so uh talk about the serial adulterer the serial killer um his nature his capacity to know and love god that is a good for him mm -hmm. right um but th this is connected in a way like with the transcendentals and i've seen them introduced in a way to try to defend this position in saint thomas that insofar as a being exists it is good mm -hmm. right but and it, what we're talking about there is the good that belongs to that human being, right? Mm. If that's all we're talking about is their existence, it may or may not be good for everyone else. Right, right. Um, and so precisely when it comes to punishment, we're taking away something that is good for somebody else, either their mm. freedom or their money or perhaps even their life uh, because justice demands it. That's right. So, right, so just right. recognizing that their nature is a good doesn't mm. mean that it is good for everyone else the nature of a serial killer right uh, is good for him but mm -hmm. his serial killing 
is bad <laughs> right. for everyone else, and that right. proceeds directly from him, right? That's so right. To, That's right. To remove the evil, we exercise the whole corrupted member. Yeah, you know, and there's this really good. Uh, that's that's all right. I think to the point in um, question five of the prima pars. This kind of came to mind here. Um, there's this question about whether goodness differs really from being, mm-hmm. and it's interesting what he says here. Of course, he says that that uh, goodness and being are really the same, right? Uh, in terms of actuality and perfection, right? which is kind of like what you're talking about, right? Where somebody uses kind of that transcendental sense, right? Uh, and then wants to say, well, just in his being, man is good, right? But Thomas actually, you know, says pretty directly here, right? In this, uh, um, in the reply to the first objection here, that um, he says, although goodness and being are really the same, nevertheless, since they different thought, they're predicated differently or different things. And he ends up saying, right, that goodness is only said of God substantially right Mm. (laughs) right which is cool right it's not said of man substantially except he says in a kind of imprecise and secondary way right it's said primarily of us in 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 terms of our addition of accidents right which is really interesting when you think about it right we come to be good or bad right by the development of virtues right which metaphysically right are accidents not substance right yeah yeah, only God, right, is substantially good in himself, right? Uh, which I think is, is pretty cool. Um, and important, relevant, right? <laughs> you know, to yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's just a misreading of Thomas's metaphysics. It's uh, people who are, you know, taught, I think, first, this sense of dignity that's Kantian and immediately right. has like a moral prescriptive ought that follows from it. And then they study St. Thomas and they've got all these sort of preconceived ideas. That right. They're looking for, right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that, yeah, if you're trying to get to St. Thomas, um, well, we have to take him on his own terms. That's right. right? Yeah. The other uh, large scale kind of philosophical uh, or ethical sort of consequence or corollary, right. Of making this shift, right. To recognizing what dignity really is and to recognizing that it can be lost and recognizing that it's um, secondary in relationship to the good, right, is that we have to recognize, right, then that dignity, right, uh, is not, I think, as you said earlier, inalienable in the human yeah. person, right, and that we might not even have equal dignity, right, I think you yeah. have to say, right, that the that, that dignity is uh, unequal, right, and proportion to your pursuit of the good, right, um, and so again, we, we have to be open to the idea of a kind of um, ethical hierarchy or ethical inequality, if you like, right? Uh, if uh, this analysis is uh, correct. Yeah, and there might even be slightly different senses operative when we're considering like um, the dignity of a you know executive of the government who sure. exercises that sort of causality over many um mm-hmm. and the dignity of a, a moral agent right who acts for the rational end like there could be a government official who only performs the acts that the community requires but he does it under some you know strange intention by as if right. it's like popularity or something you know but not because he understands that they're really good and in fact in his private life he's that serial adulterer that we've all Mm. uh we've been talking about so like there's a sense in which um yeah i think we could we could talk about dignity in terms of man's moral um moral action relative to the rational good of human nature or just in general in looser terms in um more generic terms connected with one's causal power and some end that is more universal, like mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the, the government agent. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now I think maybe someone might be worried about this, Joe. Um, if I think it's an important anxiety to address, if you're correct and we can lose our dignity, right. And that's uh, that dignity is relative to the good or that the goods prior to dignity. Um, does that mean that if somebody loses their dignity, we can just do whatever the hell we want to them? Could just enslave them, you know, uh, murder them, kill them, you know, whatever. Right. I mean, right. What, like, are you like, cause it is worth noting and McIntyre develops this, that this term dignity seemed to have a lot of purchase in the post-World War II 
context, right? They're trying to go, kind of, they're trying to get something, right? That will help them to say, look, we don't want the Holocaust to happen again, right? Yeah. We don't want, you know, like there's now, of course, everybody agrees with that, right? Uh, that that is an intention or right, as a goal. Um, how can you relieve that anxiety, that worry that um, if you say people can lose their dignity, then you're just saying you can just do whatever you want to them? Yeah, it, something that might lend itself to that uh, reading or rather misreading of Thomas was the um, what he says about when he's comparing this person who's lost his dignity to the beast. Right. He says uh, in that the reply to the third objection in question 64 that we were reading before. He says that he, he falls into the slavish state of the beast um, by being disposed of according as he is useful to others. And then he even quotes a proverb saying that the fool shall serve the wise. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the concern might be that when one has lost their dignity, um, that therefore they, they just become an object to be used however I see fit. Right. right and right, right. Uh, I can yeah then do whatever I want, whatever is advantageous to the dignified members of society. Mm -hmm. So maybe two points. Uh, the first is that this is a this is not a I don't think a black and white sort of distinction in that there is uh, dignity and then it's opposite and that there's nowhere in between. Okay. Um, and even among the extremes, of course, as we've been saying, there's the more dignified and the less sure. dignified, but right, both right. are dignified. There's the more undignified and the less undignified. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, even though they're both undignified, there's still distinctions among them. Um, and there's all sorts of people in the middle. There's some people that Aristotle or Thomas might call, you know, the consonant or the incontinent, mm -hmm. right? Who sure. are at least trying to act rationally or want to, but they... Mm -hmm. Uh, have some limited success. Right, right, right. So that's the first thing I would say is that we're not just because someone's done something which is undignified doesn't mean that, oh, dignity has gone. You're, <laughs> you're a slave to society now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. the first thing. Uh, so we need to make that distinction. And then based on that distinction, I think we turn back to the common good, right, mm -hmm. as the measure for how we treat somebody mm -hmm. who has lost their dignity. So just like with the with the body, mm -hmm. if we have a problem with a member of the body that's causing harm to the whole body, we want to treat that problem. That's right. And we that's treat right. that yeah. problem precisely in respect of the whole body. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so with the end of the whole body in mind and what's mm -hmm. actually good for the whole body, we then look to the part to see what needs to be done to make this part serve the whole again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Um, so like somebody who has uh, committed uh, theft, right? right? To stole some money to buy some drugs, let's say. Uh, they are acting in an undignified way. They're pursuing an individual good uh, over and against the common good of society. Um, but how do we how do we deal with them, right? Is mm -hmm. the is the best thing for society to take somebody like that and just kill them, mm -hmm. right, or enslave them? Well, the way we would answer that question is by like evaluating that person evaluating mm -hmm. that part of society and saying like okay can is this part irredeemably gone mm -hmm. right can right, we really right, can we right. really not reintegrate this into the whole because if you can right if if i've got an infection in, in one of my limbs but i can save my limb mm -hmm. right of course i'm going to do that instead sure. of amputating it right? Right, right 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 so you don't want to punish somebody to such an extent that you uh, eliminate them or eliminate their capacity mm. to, to serve and benefit the common good of society when they still have sure. something to uh, freely contribute. To contribute. Yeah, that's good. I like, I like that. I think both of those answers are helpful. I'll just add uh, to what you said there that a man's losing his dignity does not relieve me of the obligation to be just, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I'm still, I still have to be a, a just man myself which means that I need to render what's due right to the other person. And, you know, it, it would be disproportionate, right? <laughs> it would, it would, you know, the, the punishment needs to fit the crime, right? So it would be wrong of me to sort of, first off, I'm probably not the punisher, right? But right. besides that, uh, even if I were the, the king or the judge in that situation, I would still say, you know, um, like, you know, say petty theft, you know, capital punishment is um, excessive. Right. It's, it's beyond the measure. Right. It's uh, and so um, justice still restrains me, even if right. 
this uh, the malefactor, right? The wrongdoer has lost his dignity. I still am restrained by justice. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I've seen this uh, come out in discussions on capital punishment um, mm. with students that uh, they've asked, well, if, we, if we've got somebody who's really a serial killer and we're just mm. we're going to kill them. Why don't we harvest their organs first? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I get you. I get you. Yeah. And, All and, of a sudden we fall into this consequenceless hole. Right? <laughs> yeah. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the, the reason is because um, what justice demands, right, is the preservation mm-hmm. of the whole society. It doesn't give us a right to anything more than what secures that that's right right that's and so right. Yeah. to kill him and to harvest his organs or to rather <laughs> right. kill him by way of harvesting his organs is yes, to go altogether beyond right. what's yeah. required yeah. Yeah. Right? it's really funny i was just in a conversation uh, about this along the lines of i was like look execution sufficient to set to satisfy the demands of justice you, to, to, to to sort of you know uh in a puerile way to just sort of torture the person to death. Yeah. Right? That's excessive, right? right? I mean, that, yeah. that, that goes beyond, right, justice and becomes a kind of injustice, right? Right, yeah. We, You know, if there's some pain associated with execution, you know, by all means, we can't separate the pain and the execution mm. is what we need for justice sake. So we'll we'll uh, tolerate that the fact that, you know, maybe there's pain with decapitation, who knows? Mm. But um, we would not kill a man in a way that is, explicitly more painful than other ways that we have and in fact you know over the course of history we've actually i think worked to uh modes of execution that are less and less painful precisely so that Mm -hmm. we can secure justice and avoid all of the pain that's uh unintendedly uh following as a result that's right yeah yeah i think so good well joe uh this has been a great discussion i think uh it's really interesting to talk about dignity in this way Uh, to kind of like think about it. I think it probably, this is a good distinction here uh, that you've arrived upon in in the way Thomas at least uh, treats dignity, right? Not just as a matter of capacity, but as a matter of habit, which then sort of makes it relative to the good and something that is not properly speaking inalienable, right? Yeah. Um, And I think those are all, those are all important insights and thoughts. Did you want to wrap up with any sort of uh, final comments? Just that because it's a habit um, tending toward a certain activity, there's a contrary. There's okay, just like with right. every with every virtue, there's a contrary vice, which tends right. toward the opposite action. Um, here we have precisely that as well, mm-hmm. that a man can act in a dignified way or not. And in fact, mm-hmm. sometimes even habitually not. Right. And that yep. just that changes the the way in which we morally respond to him. Right. Yeah. That all seems uh, yeah really. Uh insightful and helpful uh thanks a lot joe for coming on and talking about this uh today really enjoyed the conversation i hope our uh audience students uh, uh benefit from this as well if you have any thoughts please uh be you know feel free to to comment uh if you found this uh, uh discussion helpful please share it with others um and uh we appreciate you know all, all that our audience does uh for us uh again thanks a lot joe um and uh, for everyone else god bless until next time bye-bye